Hi there, this is Martin from supermania78.com, or should I say Cape Wonder Europe going forward. Um, you may recognize the surroundings I'm currently in. I have made it over to Detroit, Michigan, and I'm in probably the most elaborate space for Superman collectibles, maybe in the world, and that's no exaggeration. And thanks to Mr. Jay Towers, whose collection this belongs to, um, I have been invited to have a look around uh, and see this incredible array of memorabilia, um, be it collectibles or be it the highest end props that it's possible to own. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk you through it. It's been a long time since I put a video on the channel. That's quite deliberate because I knew that whatever I did wasn't gonna live up to what you're about to see, folks. Um, it would pale in comparison. There was no point. Here I am and we're gonna do this together and I hope you're gonna be as taken with it as I am. And we're gonna work our way around this room and if there's anything that uh, is left unturned, feel free to message me and ask about what it is or you know, the nature of it. But we're gonna be pretty thorough. It's gonna be a hell of a, hell of a ride and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. I do have Mr. Towers with me. Um, this is his collection after all and so we'll be talking about you know, where the various pieces came from not necessarily how much you pay for them, that would be rude. But we're gonna talk about uh, you know, the origin of them. And a lot of it you would have seen on my channel already because uh, during our prop store visits, we've uh, talked through quite a few of the, um, uh, a few of the props, the high-end props uh, that we saw first that Jay acquired through auction. Uh, you know, it's fabulous that it, they've managed to stay within this community. Uh, it's fabulous that, you know, it's fabulous to see them again, frankly, um, you know, they never get tiring. So we're going to start with uh, this centerpiece, if you like. This, um, even though for many years it was uh, mislabeled or misconstrued to be from Richard Donner's original film, this is the crystal ship from Superman IV, The Quest for Peace, the actual prop that uh, was used uh, in the beginning of that uh, movie to um, basically say goodbye in the scene where he retrieves the uh, power crystal from his mother, energy module to be specific. Um, and after that the ship dies and, and fades away. But this piece, we still to this day don't know who was responsible for putting it together. Um, it's a fiberglass handmade cast, uh, it, it, it looks like they threw the entire book at this thing, I mean all, all of the crystal inside look to be glued separately, piece by piece, um, and then the outside looks like it might have been some kind of mottled plaster and then painted, if we're going to go into the, you know, the minute of how the thing was produced. Um, Jay has taken the trouble to light it inside just to give you the clear impression of how it would have looked on set. I did go through the trouble of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and here he is right now, folks. Mr. J. Taz himself, purveyor of the Superman Museum. When I saw Martin Lakin go through the collection of Andy Hanton at his house, I said, I hope one day to be one of your subjects. And here we are in the United States with this guy going through my office. This is better than having Antiques Roadshow here. Go ahead, continue. Very like the You're very show, And I love filming this for you. And Jim Bowers is filming. <laughs> Jim Bowers is filming. Andy Hansen has come over. Wait, so cool. where, so where, where's Andy? Andy? I'm a comedian. There's Andy. <laughs> Hi, Andy. Uh, we hijacked it. <laughs> Get in that Boris suit, Andy. All right. This is what it's all about. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this, uh, this was kind of bounced around throughout the UK. I don't think they really know what to do with it because it was such a big piece. Yeah. Um, and it ended up in various museums for the public to enjoy and it was mislabeled so yeah it was kind of set the wrong impression but this was sold by prop store yeah it's something I never thought I would have been able to get I thought this thing would have been way out of budget and I think maybe what could have held people back from bidding or was really getting it here yes I mean the way it came over here I think on a ship and then eventually in a, a FedEx semi truck that pulled in front of you know the last place I lived. I mean, it, the crate that it came in was about as big as a car, and it took up the entire garage until it was uncrated and, and in this and it was in great condition. It's remarkable that it survived mm -hmm. in, in one piece, yeah. and it's you know it, it's so good that it's here and it's it, it's in the right place. I mean, if it, if it's not going to be available to be publicly, then you know where else? Where better? 
and here. And again, just to reiterate, the orifice down here where the um, energy module um, is ejected is the, the giveaway sign. Uh, we don't believe that any of the other models of the uh, spaceship had that because it was specific to that picture. So that's that. That's, I mean, that's a favourite. So, you know, I'll, I'll probably keep going back to that. Uh, the mural, uh, check this out. Um, this is a, a Jim Bowers production, I believe. Um, just a, a super accurate uh, rendering with uh, Marlon in the top corner. Bob Peake's artwork. I think we made the effort to have the signature in, just to be sure. Um, and then we find ourselves this, <laughs> just don't know where to go next here. Cosmonaut Boris, I believe. Superman 2. Can you do an impression of Cosmonaut Boris? Did you hear what he says? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you A good year, something like that. <laughs> we've all said Yeah, we've all done it. We know we have. Um, this, what a, a spectacularly elaborate piece this is. Um, uh, spacesuit with... Oh God, there's a, it's one of those unmistakable things when you look at it closely and hopefully the image picks it up too, that with all film props, this is very reminiscent of something from Doctor Who where, you know, they, they're kind of, they put things together in such a rush and, you know, they, they use household objects. I can <clears> see that these are screw caps from something. Um, they're just plastic and they're just spray painted and glued on. Uh, this is a foil covered uh, boiler suit that's peeling in some places, which has just literally given me the idea that that's what it was at one point. Plastic plates glued on just to emphasize the fact that it is in fact a space suit. This neck collar piece would be probably uh, original from something. Um, definitely, uh, it would be hard to replicate that in such a fashion. So that that is uh, a, a genuine helmet. And the zipper on it is the strongest thing, believe it or not, in the back. Really? The zipper is the heaviest zipper I've ever seen. Right. So it could have been surplus, if, if there is such a thing, surplus spacesuit. I've always felt that this plate looks like one of the plates on his harness for flying. Okay. Where the wire is connected, yeah. a mounting plate. That's not, that's not outside the realms of possibility at all. But yes, this is, um, this is what Terran, this is the ankle that Terran Stamp grabbed to mm -hmm. boot him into the stratosphere. Uh, fragile sort of life forms. <laughs> um, Let me share one other thing if I can. Yeah. Um, Jay, while we're here, where did this come from? This is prop store. Prop store again. You can check on your side too, but you have here are the the slits here for the harness ah, on each side. Excellent. So when he's hanging upside Look at down, that. I mean, there, there you can you see that, Jim? The Absolutely. Same reinforced seam that they would put in all of Chris's costumes, so they wouldn't yeah. tear under the stress of being. Elevated by the cables. Beautiful what a piece. Fabulous piece. It's <laughs> no more words need to be spoken. It's amazing. And preserved after all this time, 1979, 80s, when they shot with this. Yeah. Just for the one scene. It's in good shape. I it's wish I had the boots shape. for it. Yeah. I, I wish we had the helmet for it, but I mean, it's. And it has been, you know, these are not. I don't know where these came from. That, yeah. That's how they were. Yeah. Yeah. We've got everybody here, every star. Most of them appearing, I'm so pleased to say, at Motor City Comic Con this very weekend, which is why we're here. Jay works tirelessly, more than any fan I know, to bring this community together. A crystal from the Fortress of Solitude. <laughs> A crystal from the Fortress of Solitude. There it is, pictured as in its original state in the console. And these things, these are really curious pieces as well because there are so many of them produced. Um, they are all, as far as we know, uh, made from uh, acrylic. They were never actual crystal. Um, they were all cut in different ways, so no two are alike. So every facet that you're seeing from, from here doesn't match another one. So if you, get, if you get opportunity to even see one of the things, Never mind to like, you know, having an elaborate display like this, but you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where, I mean, there's lots of replicas out there now. I mean, we've caught up with that in a lot of res respects, but you know, the, the old stuff, the screen new stuff is always that much rougher. It's always that much less refined because it's, you know, it's used in shots 
to be lit and light covers a multitude of sins with everything, which is why, you know, when you when you look at the uh, the astronaut costume again from a distance, it looks seamless. But when you get up close, you can see all the damage, and you can see the fact that it's not actually, you know, stitched together with all that much love. This is this is film memorabilia. These are props. Um, this next thing I want to point out. This is a beautiful uh, aside. Um, this is the setup. Uh, worn by Margot Kidder herself for Superman 2. This olive shirt and uh, pink jumper, um, very uh, 80s in its execution, um, was worn for the scenes where she throws herself mercilessly into the Niagara Falls. And I don't know if the camera is, just, is, a, is a replica, I don't think it came with the set, but um, Joe will confirm, but that camera is the same make and model as what we can see she's using here. For that very memorable scene where she jumps into the Niagara Falls expecting Superman to save her. <laughs> Polaroid one step. Polaroid one step. Is that the make and model? Yes. Very good. Um, and these were these were really prevalent in the, in the 70s and 80s. I remember them uh, very well. Um, and so, yeah, another wonderful, and uh, presented beautifully, I have to say. Mounted as it should be on a mannequin and shown off. Um, quick nudge to the Christopher Reeve autograph on this... Uh, US one sheet poster, um, which just happens to be Mrs. Tower's birthday, I'm reliably informed. I mean, how wonderful is that? What are the chances of that? More to the point. As we move round, we uh, come across the snakeskin overcoat worn by Gene Hackman for the climatic scenes of Superman for the Quest for Peace along with his pinstripe trousers and his two-tone shoes, uh, which both, I've just noticed, have splits in the back. That's interesting. Um, these were worn uh, during the scenes in the car when he's uh, escaping at the end of the picture, and also when Superman drops him off at the prison. And because that scene uh, required wire work, we can see that there is a slit put in that coat to accommodate the harness for Mr. Hackman. And I didn't know that was there until just now either. So that's, that's a fabulous discovery. Isn't this good? <laughs> I love this stuff. Moving straight on from that is possibly my favorite uh, piece that I've seen so far here. And that is the Nuclear Man costume worn by Mark Pillow. Um, this designed by John Bloomfield, um, this is so elaborate and it, I don't think the screen really gives it that much credit because when you look at it in real life, what's really uh, kind of mesmerizing about it is that it's the effort they've gone to these what appear to be glue down dots or iron on dots, I would probably venture to say because I say they're iron on because to me it looks like they've, they've started life as uh, pages. Or, or sheets, I should say, of dots, and then they've cut them into the required shape, and then they've ironed them on. That's how they've managed to get this beautiful kind of... Uh... And in the context of the film, we're led to believe that a computer weaves this, which is, you know, I'd love to get hold of one of those computers and do something similar. Velcro attachments here to keep the belt in place because this costume didn't have belt hooks. I'm fairly sure, I'm fairly certain. So that would hold that in place. No sleeves, uh, so you have like a central tunic and when the tights pull over the top. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a genuine, kind of a bygone age superhero costume, but it, you know, it, it's just fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And it, just, a, 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 if we look here, we can see it as it was used, accompanied by a set of uh, leather gauntlets, cape, and the silver belt without the loops. I was right on screen. One, one of my favorite things, Martin, with this is, and Jim, if you could show this here, you see um, we're, we're, we're missing some, some dots here. You can see there's a, a pretty obvious chunk there, right? That's missing. And if you look to the television now, Jim, uh, wherever Martin is, and, and kind of zoom in, you'll see that there is the scene and there is the costume. And that, folks, is what we call screen matched. Unmistakable provenance. This tunic uh, comes from the Movieland Wax Museum. And this was kind of Jay's 
this was your introduction to Superman. This yeah. Is, this is this is what really, this is what captured you. And you were how old? Jeez, I I think you know I saw Superman the movie in early 1979, and I was about to turn four. Yeah. And then close to the end of 79, 80, we went to the movie, not Movie Land Wax Museum, we went to the Stars Hall of Fame Wax Museum right. in Orlando. And I will grab this, but here I am <laughs> um, in front of, and you can imagine long before the internet, seeing something as close to what you know of in the movie like yeah. this, I mean, is, is pretty unbelievable. Explain the difference between the two sites. So this this whole Fortress of Solitude display and setup was in both Florida and uh, yeah, it was at first the at the Movie Land Wax Museum, and you can see there's an ad for it. There is this tunic in this ad, right. which is the great thing. I mean, I mean, you you can find a million photographs of this tunic, and it's because of this. So they did two displays. There wasn't one that they moved from one location to the other. Right. 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 The story goes is that Christopher Reeve came personally in to uh, be measured for his mannequin and whilst doing so made a phone call uh, to the UK to have costumes shipped over. So what you're looking at is a genuine Superman the movie tunic, which is exciting enough in its own right. But if you look closely, you'll see that uh, as a consequence of all, what we are, how these things go, is that they all fade. Everyone, every Superman the movie costume I've ever seen has an element of fading in it, and this is no different. This isn't nearly as badly as faded as I thought it might be, actually. I think this looks still looks in terrific shape. And the story goes that Logan Fleming, who was the wax artist for just That's about everything at yeah. Movieland Wax Museum that you've known and seen over the years, Logan Fleming um, had a, a measurement se session with Chris yeah. uh, in, in early January, I believe, of 79. I'm pretty sure it was early January of 79. And um, in his book, he says that Chris was a little distraught that day, very polite, but distraught that there was a, a tabloid interview or a tabloid story about him on how he lost the weight. And, and it was, I think, an inquirer or something like that. But he was very jarred by that tabloid story and they kind of got through this fitting. And then, like you mentioned earlier, Chris himself, um, got a hold of Warner Brothers and donated a screen-worn costume. Which one it is, we don't know. Um, but obviously it was to his measurements specifically because that's he was measured and then he just got a, they sent over a costume. So they had to fit based on his measurements. And just like the Nuclear Man costume giving its tell away right here, the tell on this particular outfit is this run that comes down from the collar as a result of putting the mount in the cape onto the costume. And it didn't escape all of the photography associated with promotion of the museum itself. So again, breathtaking provenance. It just doesn't get any better. And Jay, you got hold of this how? Oh, it's a long Where story. Where did it come from? It's a long, long story and it passed many hands. Yeah. Um, but don't you think the delicious irony? A private, a private, just a private uh, dealer. Not even a dealer, just somebody that I think owned the point it. is, though, yeah. it ended up in your hands. Yeah. And, you know, with, I mean, that photo kind of tells you what you need to know. Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, just, I mean, just look at the kid's face. It's just, I remember for me personally, uh, when I went, traveled down to London for the first time with my parents and I saw the waxwork at Man of Two Swords. No, not nearly as, as well achieved as this, but when we went to Man of Two Swords and there was a figure of Christopher Reeve in the stairwell flying up, I've got lots of photos of that. That was my moment, same as Jay's moment when he saw that for the first time. That was my moment. I was like, my God, there he is. Or at least, you know, that's as close as I'm probably going to get to him in this life. I've never seen that promotional. Uh, we didn't have that in the UK. This never arrived. We never had those set of glasses. Uh, so that's the first time I've seen the cardboard standee that comes with it. The Chris Meadows painting, uh, an original Kate Wonder yes. city cover. Yes. Uh, to Jay, love from Margo Kida, God rest her soul, we love you to bits, Margo. Um, number plate from Superman 4. Uh, I have one of these too, I'm pleased to say. Uh, these are terrific because you can tell uh, that they were used in some of the scenes when Nuclear Man decides he's going to blow up most of the metropolis because most of the burn residue is still present mm. on the plate to see. 
you know, we don't wash that kind of stuff off. That's fabulous. There's a great picture of, and you can show it down here, of Aaron Smolinski when he got to hang with Christopher Reeve during the filming of Superman 3, um, had one of those great movie books. Right. And uh, Christopher Reeve signed that book for him, and that is a gift from Aaron Smolinski on the left. That came directly from Aaron? Yeah. Fantastic. Some fabulous statues, collectibles. I'm, I'm seeing DC Direct, I'm seeing Iron Studios, I'm seeing the Hot Toys figure. That, the Hot Toys figure kind of kicked off a revolution. And it's still to this day, probably, arguably, you know, the, the bang on that we talk about. Yeah. Um, and now just, I mean, this is your most recent acquisition, Jay? Yes. Tell us about this. This is um, a Derek Meddings. This is from Superman 2. Derek uh, Meddings. Yeah, uh, from, the, um, from, the, from the Battle of Metropolis. Oh, uh, another great item from Prop Store. So are the miniature uh, signs that were used. So that's all included. There's something here from a, a mailbox. But there is a scene where uh, Superman gives a nice underground kick we think, to, to non-Jack O'Halloran, and he comes through the street. And uh, this is moments in this photo before he comes through the street. And this car right here with the lights on is this car right here. So for scale, if I put my hand against it, I'm reckoning that's maybe in the region of one six scale. Can you imagine? I mean, for the Metropolis miniature, there were dozens of these things. And this is a self-lit prop. And from, from 1979, 80, when, you know, in England, where there was no technology <laughs> at all. And look at this. These are the lengths they have to go to. I mean, this looks like it's been repainted. This was originally a taxi, looking at it, because it's yellow underneath. Um, oh, okay. See? Okay. Possibly. I'm just, I'm just uh, speculating, but, you I know. I thought those were splatters, but I think you're right. Giving, given the tendency of them, I mean, what's what make a model of these? Is that the same car make a model in front? Could be. Yeah. It looks like a Ford F one fifty or a. Um, there you go. An LTD. Yeah. Well, the tendency to reuse things uh, mm -hmm. was. Uh, I mean, you know, this is a big ass kit. Yeah. <laughs> the wiring in the back is still present. I can see the connectors for what would have been the battery pack that would have been in the boot to light the headlights, um, and possibly the rear lights too because that's the links that they went to. That is a staggering piece. One other thing, um, Savage Sad Boy Customs, just because we want to give them a shout out, actually created this. And if you notice, there is a little rip in the tunic and that is custom made to resemble the best it can, the Movie Land <laughs> Wax Museum. Very good. Figures. Very so that's good. kind of the expression and, uh, and all of the wax figure. One to one, a big jack. Um, fans, if uh, you're familiar with it, you've probably seen the black and white still of Stuart Freeborn mm -hmm. uh, putting the finishing touches on these things. There was a set. There was one made for every every principal cast member, and this, as far as I know, is the only existing copy of Jack. We can see that uh, the, the ears were added later, and they were foam, and we know that because the foam has degenerated like foam does. We also can see that uh, we didn't cast the top of Jack's head because that plate on top was fixed on later. And we can also see glue residue around the chin and around the mustache area because that's where they would have glued on the hair pieces. Some of which still remains, still remains after 40 years. Can you get your breath? It's amazing. Film history, as we speak, right in front of you. Never gets tired. What an amazing piece, even signed to my friend Jay. From Big Jack himself. Next to that, another gorgeous piece, another piece of uh, crystalline acrylic made specifically for, well, we still haven't, we're still arguing amongst ourselves where this came from because there's a still, uh, there's a little sequence in the making of Superman 2 where it looks like one of these appears on somebody's, a draftsman's desk at the art department. Um, in the meantime, I was convinced it was from Superman 4, the deleted scene with the guy that they got to fill Jarrell's costume out. It looks like there's a whole set of these in front of what they, uh, they uh, rebuilt the uh, Starship from. But again, it's just one of those things. All we know is that, is that it's a fabulous production used piece. This is a radar tower uh, Eiffel from tower. the Eiffel Tower. Yes, and that's the railing from the Eiffel Tower. From Superman, the Superman 2 miniature. Mm -hmm. This which you may or may not know, Jay, came from a fellow called Steve Camden, 
Steve Camden, uh, I've been in touch with for decades. Steve Camden was the original operator for K9, the Doctor Who's robot dog. That's how he got started in the industry. He was a young kid and he knew his way around a remote control and so he piloted K9. He went on to work at Pinewood where he uh, delivered Christopher Reed his mail along with all of the uh, principal stars and he said that Chris was a very shy, self-effacing young man. And besides these pieces, uh, this, this tower and this railing, I think Steve had also pieces from Moonraker and a couple of other Bond films. Tell me about the figure. It came came with the Eiffel Tower uh, miniatures. So during that sequence in Superman 2 where they're just about to blow the lift, mm -hmm. there's a couple of technicians on top of that tower and I think that that doubles right. up. And then you also have the baseball from Superman 4. What that, uh, an is incredible piece that tossed is. Tossed at Clark to, to hit. <laughs> So this was a prop store, we've seen this piece before, yeah. but this was the one that was uh, actually used on set for Chris to take a swing at. Because he never could hit a curveball. Metropolis police badge, Jay? Yes. Tell us about that. I feel like that came from Alexi. Our yeah. friend Alexi. Our friend Alexi, mm -hmm. back in the UK. Shooting stage sign from? Superman 2. Pinewood? Yes. Yep. Look at that. I mean, and an original perfect. ticket to the episode of Saturday Night Live hosted by Christopher Reed. Ah, very good. Boy, this is one of my favorite things ever. Um, a great, great gift from Mr. Jim Bowers. But these are uh, pieces of blanket material from Superman the movie that uh, Susanna York holds uh, young, uh, young Cal el in, yellow and blue. Jim, you can speak to it. Yes, uh, I actually acquired this directly from Ilya Salkind. Wow. And uh, these were the blankets. Yes. Material, fabric, uh, extra, that was used uh, in the jor laboratory. So, being as this is encased, exactly as it should be, it's kind of difficult to, uh, to elaborate on it. But what I can tell you straight off is that I can see a border of fabric around the top of that that is the reflective 3 a material. Yes. Uh, and the blanket looks like it's lined, but it looks like, it looks very much like um, gel, uh, the kind of stuff you use on top of studio lighting to create different colors. It looks like sheets of that uh, backed from behind to give it some heft. And when I threw direct light on this for yes. photography, yes. both of these, particularly the yellow one, yeah. glowed very brightly. Uh, like, just like it does in the picture. Yeah. Right. It's hard to see, but you can, I'm shining light on it now. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's 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 tough to get. It. Tough. I mean, yeah. boy, if, if, if you take a, a if you take a still it. photograph of that with a uh, with, with a flash, flash, it blows the camera. Absolutely. So I mean, this is just kind of indicative of what it was like. You know, the the innovation that these craftsmen threw at this picture. Every trick in the book. Every every trick of light. Every camera. Uh, every camera position technique known to man was thrown at this picture to try and take it to that next level. No CGI, no, no other method, no other method whatsoever of creating illusion on film. You had technicians, you had engineers, and you had artists. And the combination of those three things is what produced these actual items. There was no way to replicate these items. I mean, which brings me very neatly to this. This is a fabulously unique piece. Now I'm going to go into a bit of the history of this because I'm, I'm speculating a little bit, but if you look at the detail and if you get close to the actual design of it and if you look at the graphics and the way they're applied, it might remind you of either the interior of the Death Star, maybe some of the interiors from 2001, and maybe even the control panel from the Millennium Falcon. And the reason for that is they were all designed by the same guy and his name was Harry Lang or Harry Lange, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. But he was a very talented designer that worked on all three of those films. And his particular style kind of permeates everything because if you look at that and then you look at the telephone from the president's telephone from the deleted scenes of Superman the movie, it's got that same kind of aesthetic yeah. there. Um, and this is actually one of the video cameras from Lex Luthor's lair. Um, this, I don't think, was in any way... Uh, animated other than maybe turned from uh, off camera. Um, I don't believe the zoom lens is moved or anything like that. So it's just a big, 
It is in fact, I can see uh, a plywood box, folks, that's been painted and literally has plastic bits stuck onto it. And that is a wooden dowel at the top, a metal rod, probably with a ball bearing on top just to move it around and a bit of cable, a bit of flex to put between it. It's just so good. It's so genius. And yet on camera, it looks terrific. There is a small light, which is a functional bulb I can see underneath, um, probably powered by the same flex that was, we're led to believe is what's powering the camera. It is enormous. It is about 14 inches along this box. Where did this come from, Jay? This uh, came from an uh, eBay purchase. Just a man on eBay who said he was saving up for a wedding and uh, wanted to part with some things. So. What kind of person has something like this <laughs> I don't know. stashed away in their shed, just waiting for the right time for somebody like us to come along and go, we'll take it. You can, it. you can see this uh, when Ned Beatty is walking through as well. Yeah. Yes. It's if you, if you step over, shot. Andy, this way, we look at the television, there again, there we go. There's ah, the there's the light. So folks, if I draw your attention to that, Look how the thing photographs. I mean, you'd never guess that in what you've seen there, this wooden box looks so incredibly convincing on 35 mil film. This was motorized. That couldn't be seen, but they're all still in there. So there was a motor in there? There is a motor in there, Indeed. yeah. This is mounted here. Um, but above there, I do have a nine volt battery and if you mess with it the right way, you can get this light to come on. But you can see everything it does in the movie from yeah. its turn and, and, tilt. and its tilt, all, you know, still today, do that it's Incredible. just it's, it's fried inside. what are the chances <laughs> so we think this was used in the fire and ice scene this was uh, blasted with uh, all sorts for want of a better expression uh, during the gauntlet scenes um, and the fact that it survived in such pristine condition is you know fabulous I mean there he is folks this is what it's all about we miss him don't we mm. yes yeah we certainly do and there's nobody like him nobody looked nobody looked like him to this day, nobody even resembles him. He's just, uh, you know, and what you're looking at now is just living proof. There will never be another one like him. If you pan down, tell us about this, Jay. That's from uh, Superman 4, uh, the opening scene in space. The, uh, the, the capsule that goes out of control, uh, it, it's mounted right on there and uh, easy to see. It is a... Uh, it is not the miniature, it is a full size. It's attached right to the top, and there's a shot of Chris when he stops that and slows it down, and, and, you'll, and you'll see it right there. There's only one of them on the capsule, so that was attached to the life-size one that he landed on. Again, not, a, not the miniature version. That's why it's so big. It is big when you actually pick it up and hold it. Uh, it's a painted wood centerpiece with attachments. Uh, the cups or the jets or, or whatever, I'm not sure. They could be plastic or resin casts. Um, but it, <laughs> it actually looks like a, a piece of NASA machinery, <laughs> which, you know, with a, a, a rattle can and a bit of red tape, isn't it amazing what you can, uh, what you can produce? Because that, that, looks, that looks quite dangerous. <laughs> I don't want to touch it. So it's, you know, it's all convincing stuff. Uh, full costume. Uh, we're going to be talking about this later, this, oh, I don't know where to begin with this, what a, it is exactly what it says in the tin. Um, bust from, what's this chap's name? Admiral Mick. Sorry? Admiral Mick. Admiral Mick. Who managed, who managed Bang On, didn't he? He did manage He managed Bang On. on. That is a fabulous sculpture. And so, that is a very, very brief, believe me, overview, <laughs> because I could go on and on and on. We'll finish where we started. Yeah. This is, uh, I mean, I'm taking it this didn't come from Ikea. Pal, no. So. <laughs> no. You want to tell us about this yeah. and the fact that we're going to be taking it back to the UK. Right. Me, because oh. Andy set his heart on it and it seems such a shame to deprive him of it. So, yeah. yeah. This is, um, you know, Tom, Tom Spina Designs, so if you look up on, on the internet there, uh, he creates really amazing. Tom Spina did this? Tom Spina, yeah. Wow. Yeah, uh, when I first got this house, and I just said, you know, I, I know I want to have this room, and I just want a Fortress of Solitude desk. And when you type that in online, the options weren't mm. that what I was looking for. <laughs> so I said, I he said he, you know, he said, do you do you want to commission me to do it? I said yes. He gave me a page of designs. There are about five different versions really? of this that so he drafts. They drafts, yeah. Okay. And I I picked the one that looked to me like 
the Fortress of Solitude from afar. Absolutely. That, that you saw after, you know, Jeff East created it. And that's 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 how I wanted it to and look. And it's from It's yeah, it's styrofoam. It is painted in the material that they use in theme parks to make sure it's as it, you know, he said you can paint uh, a watermelon with this material and drop it off of a cliff and it won't break. So it's very, very sturdy. It's in three pieces and they actually found a desk, bought it, and then built this around the desk. So it comes away in pieces to be cleaned and vacuumed and, and fits all back together nicely. It's amazing how closely it resembles the actual set. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean these the columns finish here, it, I mean, yeah. that's what they do. They really nailed it. The finish of it. So, Jay, thank mm. you so much. Martin Lakin, thank you. For allowing me to just be overcome. And I'm going to go and cry for a bit after. after <laughs> um, it's Jeez, just... I haven't even taken you down to the basement yet. Yeah, well, that's, that's part <laughs> two. That's part two. <laughs> that's part two. After I've you know, wept a little, we'll, 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 I'll dry up and we'll, we'll go down there. But, you know, it's like I said, folks, how could I possibly do anything else that would kind of, you know, come in, hang on the coattails of something like this? This is as good as it gets. I'm so pleased to see that they're being looked after and loved. Um, I buy things to own things, not to sell things. So right. this is this uh, stays with me. And that's all the motivation that anybody really needs. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, I know they're investors. I know people want to flip this kind of stuff, and it's all out there still. But when you see it, it really comes home when it's all in one space, mm -hmm. and when it's presented in such a fashion that you know that whoever whoever it is that owns it is really in love with the subject, as we all are here. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about this. You wouldn't be watching it. And you know, it, it's just. Yeah, there's nothing that doesn't catch your eye here. So I get migraines. I, I, I don't know how you cope. If you're sat at this desk, you must have such a, a great feeling of, you know, your accomplishment all being around you and being reminded constantly of this in, this whole kind of gamut of history of these pictures because they mean so much to us. Yeah, they just they just do. Don't it's they? a very positive workspace. It really is. I mean, whether <laughs> and there's that. You know, this is where I do a lot of homework. But yeah, it, it's a great happy place for me to be. And uh, like we talked about so many times, anytime you can capture your childhood and feel nostalgia, um, there's no difference between this room and the first time I saw that film. And that's what you want every day. You want to spark that every day. And you're always looking for more of it. You always want to keep reigniting. So that's what that's why I have this. That's and there's something wrong with me. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the final word. Yeah. Thank you for watching, folks. See you soon.